Hi, and welcome back for part six of our video series, The Biggest Story, How the Snake Crusher Brings Us Back to the Garden. So I am so excited to see you all again, even if it is virtually. Last week, we worked through the first five chapters of this particular book, and that brought us through the halfway point. So we've covered a lot of ground so far, but there's still more to the biggest story, and that's what we're going to jump into today. So really quick recap of where we left off last week. Okay, We started in the beginning. We saw that God created everything and that it was perfect. And then people sinned. And God had to cast people out of his perfect garden. And then what we're seeing now is, again, this pattern of just people sinning. Okay, the people will sin. And we've talked about how sin is what separates us from God. But even though the people keep sinning, God still loves and cares for his people and is working on a plan to bring them back to the perfection of the garden. So on Friday, in our part five video, we exited the book of Exodus and we worked through the books of Joshua and Judges specifically. So we saw a pattern emerging for God's people. God would give them rules and a promise, but the people continually disobeyed. Then God would punish the people's sin and the people would cry out for forgiveness. God would grant forgiveness, but the people would still continue to fall back into that pattern of sin. But God hadn't forgotten his people. He was with them during their captivity in Egypt, and he showed great power over creation to free them. And he was with them still as he gave them the Ten Commandments. And then he gave the people leaders and judges who could help them follow his commandments. Because ultimately, God's commandments were for the people's good and for God's glory. But even still, the people of Israel just couldn't get it right. They were a mess. But God was still going to keep his promise that the promised Savior was going to come from this group of people, this messed up group of people who just couldn't get it right. God was still going to give them a Savior. And so that's where we're going to pick up today. So we're going to look at chapter six. So here we go. God's people had a hard time not copying everyone else around them. This was especially true when it came to having a king. Although God warned them how bad kings could be, they just had to have one. So eventually, God gave them a king. Be careful what you ask for. You just might get it. The first king was Saul. He was very impressive height-wise and pretty disappointing in every other way. The second monarch, young David from Bethlehem, was definitely much better. In fact, before we get to the king, there's almost no one more important than King David. When David wasn't busy sinning, which he did in some really big ways, he was a good, wise, and merciful king. Many good things happened to God's people when David was in charge. They were victorious and prosperous and blessed. But the best thing that happened was what God promised would happen. God told David he would always have a son to sit on the throne. He promised David an everlasting kingdom. This was good news for David and even better news for God's people. It meant that God had not forgotten the guarantee he made in the garden. A deliverer was on his way. And now everyone who had ears to hear knew he would be a son of David. But the next son of David was not the one they were looking for. Solomon started off on the right foot, but he ended up tripping quite spectacularly. After Solomon, the kingdom split in two, with Israel in the north and Judah in the south. Neither kingdom was very good. God punished Israel first, then Judah. In the course of 400 years, God's people would go from top dog to dog food. They had been kicked out of their promised land just like Adam and Eve had been kicked out of their paradise. And worst of all, David's house and David's throne were no more. The future looked bleak, especially for the promises of God. And that's where we're going to stop today. Again, we're ending kind of on another bleak note where things just don't look so good for the people. But that's important to note in our story because we know hope is coming. God has made a promise and he's still working on keeping it. 
So today's section of our story covers the kingdom of Israel. So what we're seeing happen here is that God's people wanted a king. They had been delivered into the promised land. They had been given commandments by God. God had given them judges and leaders to help them follow the word. And they keep falling back into this pattern of sin. But now the people are saying, we want a king. Everyone else has one. Why shouldn't we? So not only do they want something just because everyone else has it, but this is also a way they, of them saying, we think somebody else can do a better job than you, God. We think if we had a king, things would be better. We just had this one thing, things would be better. Didn't quite work out that way. So that's where we're going to pick up in our key passages for today. So you know the drill. Pause the video. Run, get your Bible. If you have it in front of you already, that's good. That means you've been tracking with me and you knew I was going to ask for it anyway. But if not, just pause the video, run and grab it. Or if you don't have one right available to you, okay, you can just pause the video um, and either go find one or wait and then just go back and read it later. So we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 10. So you can see we're starting to move a little bit deeper into our Bible now. We're about halfway through the Old Testament. Okay. So we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 10. And then we're going to look at verses 17 through 19. And then we're going to skip down just a little bit and look at some other verses. All right. So starting in verse 17. Now Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mizpah. And he said to the people of Israel, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt, and I delivered you from the hands of the Egyptians and from the hand of all the kingdoms that were oppressing you. But today you have rejected your God who saves you from all your calamities and your distresses. And you have said to him, Set a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. Now we're going to skip down just a little bit. Okay, and we're going to look at verse 22. So they inquired again of the Lord, is there a man still to come? And the Lord said, behold, he has hidden himself among the baggage. Then they ran and took him from there. And when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. And Samuel said to all the people, do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? There is none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted, long live the king. So where we're picking up in this particular passage, we've got Samuel and Samuel is delivering a message from God to the people. So what Samuel is telling the people is he's reminding them first of what God has done for them. And again, that's a pattern that we see too. Israel tends to forget all of the good things that God has done for them. So when they ask for things, okay, or when God is just talking to his people, he reminds them that he is he is a good father who cares for his people. And so that's what he starts by having Samuel tell them here. He's the God of Israel who brought them out of Egypt. He delivered them from the hands of the Egyptians. And then when they finally got to the promised land, he delivered them from the people who they were fighting against in the promised land too. But they're rejecting God and then God is giving them a king. So that's what we see here in the first part. Then when we skip down to verse 22, Okay, they brought all the people together and they were going to recognize the man that God had called to be king. And so they're looking and they can't find him. So they inquired again of God. They said, is there a man still to come? They're like, where is he? He's not here. Okay, and the Lord said to the people, behold, he has hidden himself among the baggage. So God is telling the people, he's like, this man that I'm going to make your king, he's over there. He's hiding. Okay. That's not a great start for a king to be hiding from your responsibility. But that's where Saul finds himself. He's hiding in the baggage. So they ran and the people bring him out and he stands taller than anyone else. So that's kind of a defining trait of Saul is that he's, just, he's a very tall person. And then Samuel asked the people, he said, Do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? This is, this is the guy. This is the guy that God has chosen to be king over you. And the people shall long live the king. So again, kind of an interesting start. And it lets us know right away that these, pe these people that God are calling to be kings of the nation of Israel are not perfect. Some of them are going to be very good kings. We're going to hear about David. And David was a very good king. Okay? Things went well while David was king. 
kind of like they did when the judges were in charge, which is what we talked about in our last section. But ultimately, these kings are flawed. They still sin. They're not perfect. So they're not going to do things perfectly all the time. Okay? And that's an important thing to remember. Okay? Is we can have we can have good leaders. Okay? And the people of Israel had good leaders, but ultimately their faith and their trust needed to be in the God who provided those leaders to them. Okay, so that's where we're going to skip to next. So now we're going to skip talking about Saul and now we're going to move to when David is king. And again, as it said in our book, David was a really good king. Again, things went well while David was in charge. Um, the Bible tells us that David was a man after God's own heart. When we look at the Psalms, David wrote many of the Psalms okay? and they show us his heart for God and they help us worship God better. Okay. But again, David wasn't perfect. But what we're going to see is God is going to make a covenant or a promise with David and tell him about a king who is going to come. So now we're going to flip over and we're going to look at 2 Samuel chapter 7. Okay, so we're going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and we're going to start in verse 12. So this is going to be God talking to David and telling David about what is going to happen later. So this is going to be a covenant or a promise between God and David. So starting in verse 12, it says, When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. So the promise that we have here is, again, another promise of God not abandoning his people. There's hope even when things seem to be falling apart. Here in 2 Samuel in this covenant with David, God is promising David that he will build a kingdom that will last forever. And that kingdom is going to come from David's family. So this may have seemed a little confusing, okay, especially when the kingdom fell apart. So we know that the kingdom of Israel didn't last forever. Okay, the kingdom fell apart. And so it must have been a little confusing for the people when they were like, God, you promised us an everlasting kingdom and now we're split and now we've been taken into captivity and we don't even have a kingdom anymore. But God is still keeping his promises. And what God was promising David here was a different kind of king, a king who would reign forever and who wouldn't be like Saul or David or Solomon. He was going to be better. He was going to be perfect. He wasn't going to sin or be afraid um, of, of leadership and of things like that, like the people here, okay? He was going to be perfect, okay? And so that harkens back to that promise that God made Eve in the garden. Someone was coming who was going to set things right. And that someone was going to come from David's family. So now that's kind of where we're going to stop for today with our key passages. We're going to talk about some questions that I want you guys to think about at home. So you know what I want you to do with these questions. I want you to either talk about them with your parents, talk about them with a sibling, or I want you to grab that journal that I encourage you to start keeping, and I want you to jot your answers down. Again, it's so important that we take time to think through what scripture says. Okay? We have to think through what does this tell me about God? What does this tell me about people? Is this passage giving me a commandment that I should follow? Is it giving me a promise that I need to hold on to? So it's important for us to take what we read and to and to think about it in those terms. So when I'm giving you these questions at home, that's really what I want you guys to do. Okay, is I don't want you to just write down an answer and be like, yeah, that's it. I'm done. Thanks, Miss Danielle, for giving me more homework while I was at home. What I want you to do is really take time and think about what is the Bible trying to say about God? Okay, so that's what the purpose of these questions is. All right, question number one. Why do you think God's people still wanted a king, even though God warned them that kings could be bad? 
So they kept asking. They were like, God, give us a king. Give us a king. Give us a king. We want a king. We want a king. We want a king. Everybody else has one. Why can't we have one too? As so they keep asking, okay, and God keeps telling them, having a king's not all it's cracked up to be. It's it's not it's not gonna it's not gonna go the way you think it's gonna go. Okay. But still they keep asking, they keep asking it. And so God gives them a king. And as we see, some of the kings do good things for the people. Okay, but ultimately the kingdoms fall apart. So think about that. Why do you think God's people still wanted a king? Even though God warned them that kings could be bad and that things weren't going to turn out the way they thought. And then I want you to think about have you ever wanted something? Even though someone warned you it could be bad for you. It can be something small. It doesn't have to be something big like a king. Okay? But I want you to think about have you ever wanted something that someone warned you could be bad for you? All right. Question number two. Describe the three thing, the three kings we heard about in this passage. I'm going to drop some scripture references down here at the bar. That way you guys can go back and you can read them. Um, and get a little bit more context. So I want you to describe the three kings. We heard about Saul, we heard about David, and we heard about Solomon. So I want you to think about in what ways were those kings good, in what ways were they not so good? So I want you to go back, read some of those passages, help you answer your questions. Think about what ways were these kings good kings for the people, and what ways were they not so good kings for the people? Question number three. How do you think the people felt when the kingdoms fell apart and then they were punished for their sins. So again, we see God make a covenant with David and God promises David an everlasting kingdom that's going to come from David's family. And then there, there's no kingdom anymore. God made this promise and things very quickly after David just kind of fall apart. Okay, so how do you think that caused the people to feel? We know that the promises of God are true. And if you're familiar with them, the rest of this book, you know how the story is going to play out and we know what's going to happen next. And we know ultimately God is going to keep that promise to build an everlasting kingdom. But in the moment, think about how they must have felt. Okay, so those are your three questions for today. I want you to think about those things and then we're going to pick up again tomorrow with chapter seven. So let's pray together and then I will close this out. God, I just thank you for another day and another time where we can gather together um, virtually. Um, Lord, it just, it makes me so happy to think that um, that all over our state, um, Lord, that our RHC family is worshiping and is gathering together, even though we can't gather together um, in the church building, Lord God. Um, I thank you for the promise that you will build an everlasting kingdom. Um, for your people. And I thank you, Lord, that your promises hold true even when things seem like they're falling apart. Um, God, I just thank you so much for for your word and for all of the truths that it offers us. Um, God, I just pray that you be with us in this time that we're apart um, and help us, Lord, to, to just use this time to grow, um, to grow in your word and to trust you more deeply. I just thank you Lord, for all that you are and for all that you do, I just pray, Lord, that you be with us until we can gather together again. In Jesus' name, amen. So that is it for today. Again, if you have time, go back and read some of those passages from today's story with your parents or a sibling or by yourself. Um, these are great passage passages that help us kind of build the history of the nation of Israel. Um, but they're also good to help us see the promises of God. They help us see where people fall short, but how God is going to remain faithful in his promises. So take some time, go back and read those passages. Then I want you to think about some of those questions um, that we mentioned in today's video. Um, I will see you all again tomorrow for part seven. We're going to look at more promises and then comfort for the people. So again, today things kind of fell apart, but tomorrow we're going to look at promises and comfort for the people. Have a great day. Remember to be kind. Show the love of Jesus to your family and your friends and whoever else you interact with today. I am praying for you always, and I will see you soon.